So we told you before on this show that people misinterpreted Brexit just like they're misinterpreting. By the way, not only they misinterpreted, they ignored it. Uh, because predatory capitalism is failing worldwide right now. It's failing in America. What are you talking about? I'm talking about capitalism based on the banks. When the banks dictate economic policy, it's crumbling. And that's what's happening right now. They're In America, richest country in the world, half the country's poor. That's called a failure. Also, uh, you go to Greece. Barack Obama's there. They're throwing Molotov cocktails right now. That's how much they enjoy global capitalism. They're throwing Molotov cocktails because Barack Obama's on his farewell tour, and Greece is like, you fucking capitalistic piece of shit. And that's happening. That's going to happen in uh, Spain. Italy's failing. Same shit's happening there. It's happening. I'm t- so they ignored it. And we did a segment about Brexit with this political scientist from Brown University. He's called uh, Mark Blythe, right? And uh, he's got some more stuff to say. This was real interesting. Let's listen. He has this to say about the Trump election. Talk about what you think happened. Sure. So I wasn't surprised at all. Um, Many of you have been sat here in this room with me where I've spoken about global Trumpism and various things like this. The first time I came out publicly and said I thought that he would win was at a Watson event in May last year. Uh, I did an interview in Greece that went viral when I predicted both Brexit and Trump. And it's not because I have a clear, voyant crystal ball sitting under my bed or I made a pact with Satan to see the future in a mirror. It's simply, it's, it's pretty obvious if you think about it in a more global way. This is not a local event. Everything that Professor Schiller just said is true about this election, but Brexit happened. There's a left-wing version of this that brought us Greece. There's the shrinkage of centre-party votes across the entire OECD. There's the collapse of left-wing parties' votes, in particular, across Western Europe. Uh, Coming up next, Renzi is going to fail in Italy in the referendum that's coming up, which will cause a constitutional crisis in Italy. Shortly after that, we have the French election coming up. I would like to remind you of the following statistics. Uh, The lowest George Bush ever got, George Bush uh, Jr. got as president in uh, in, uh, his uh, approval rating was 29%. The president of France currently has an approval rating of 4%. Imagine that. There's someone lower than Congress in the world. And what do you think is going to be coming after that? So after pretend lefty policies fail because of economic bankerism, what do you think comes after that? Fascism? And the National Front have nearly 40% of the intended vote. So even with the design of the French Constitution, which makes it very difficult and you have to have a second round, etc., the most popular political party by a factor of two in France is the National Front. So right-wing fanatics are going to take over in France. Of the German elections coming up, Merkel is vulnerable. How is all of this going to play out and what is it all connected? Here's a simple way of thinking about it. From 1945 until 1975, we targeted a particular economic variable called full employment. And there's a thing called the Lucas Critique, which basically says if you keep targeting something, people will game it. And they did. Unions gamed it, employers gamed it, and the result was inflation. And after a while, that inflation became painful, painful enough for the people who were hurt by it, who were the creditor classes in these countries, to band together and fund a market-friendly revolution. And they liberated finance, and they deregulated banks, and they integrated the economies of the world. And they globalized labor such that labor could no longer demand that it gets its share of productivity, because if you don't, I'll just move your job somewhere else. And all of those trade agreements that were signed, the globalization, which is inevitable and we can't roll back, you know you can go on the web and type in WTO text. And you'll find that it's a very long 700-page legal agreement that took five years to thrash out between corporate interests, lawyers, lobbyists, with very little input from civil society. The same is true of the EU's agreements on capital movements, the banking union, take your pick. And there's a moment when people just began to figure out that for the past 30 years, going from 1985 until now, huge amounts of money have been generated in the global economy. And as we know from the work of Thomas Piketty and others, Most of it's gone up to a tiny fraction of the population. So there's been a huge amount of growth, but hardly anyone's benefited. You don't have to go far to see this. Get off the east side. So what he's saying is the last 30 years, the the global economy has boomed. 
We've globalized labor, meaning so if you get too uppity, we're going to take your job. We're going to send it to someone even poorer and more desperate in a more poorer country than you. That's what he's saying. The west side of Providence. Go to northwest Providence and walk into neighborhoods which have check cashing agencies, fried chicken joints, pawn shops, broken down fix your mobile and networks you've never heard of stores. That's the reality for people, not just here, in many, many countries. So they're a bit fed up with this. And they've decided at any possible opportunity, whether it's Brexit, the Italian constitutional referendum or anything, to basically give their elites notice that we've had enough of this. And that's what this is. Now, there's a macroeconomic underpinning to this one, too, because after we decided to target uh, full employment for 30 years, we decided to target inflation for 30 years. I don't see why the Lucas critique doesn't actually apply to that one as well. And we've managed to create a world in which you can dump 13 trillion euros into the global money supply through quantitative easing and other programs, and there's no inflation anywhere. And here's your problem. When you've levered up your banking system and bailed it out, dumped it on the public purse and said you need to cut that terrible debt, when people's <laughs> personal balance sheets are still bloated from the, all, the, all the credit they took on in the 2000s, and they don't have wage growth, and there's no inflation to ease the burden of the debt, then the creditors fight harder to get their money back, whether it's the case of Germany versus the rest of the Eurozone, whether it's the form of the creditor class versus the debtor class. What we have everywhere are creditor-debtor standoffs. And those credit or debtor standoffs take different forms. For the left, it takes the form of Podemos. For the right, it takes the form of the National Front. And for Trump, which has a weird coalition, which is, of course, sexist and, of course, racist and, of course, anti-immigrant and all the rest of it. But one part of it is, if you look at the states that really fell hard, the Rust Belt, it's economic. Now, if you recognize that simple fact, You can put Trump in there with Brexit. You can put Trump in there with Jeremy Corbyn. You can put him in with all the rest of it. And I'll leave you one set of numbers that I found today, which I think is just an absolute clangor for this whole thing. In 2015, Wall Street bonuses, not regular compensation, bonuses, seven years after they were bailed out with the public purse, totaled, when I get this right, $28.4 billion dollars. Total compensation paid to every single person in this country who earns a minimum wage, $14 billion. I'll stop there. So, when I say that capitalism is failing worldwide, it's not hyperbole. Like, our society is failing worldwide. So we've all bought into this globalism which is really predatory capitalism which is a race to the bottom which is who can i exploit next capitalism and right now they're using a ton of prison labor right here in america that's the that's the G, that's the dream wet dream of a corporation to have prison labor they can't organize and they work for slave wages so If you're still wondering what the fuck is going on in the world, Trump and Brexit, huh? France is going to be right wing. What? Greece, what happened, huh? Italy, next. And they just keep doing, sticking their head in the sand over and over and over and over. Keep letting our banks exploit our economies. Predatory capitalism. That's what this is. He's laying it out for you. So keep pretending it's sexism. Keep pretending it's... Yeah, that's us. We've always had those things. But keep ignoring that half the country in America is poor and in poverty. We pay twice as much for our health care. No one gives a shit. Everyone's like, yeah, I guess that's just how it is. You got to be a fairy duster to think well, we, we can have the same health care as the rest of the world. You got to be a fairy duster because you know we're corrupt. Our government's corrupted 100%. What are you, a child? Grow up and sell out. That's the American sentiment. And you know what that leads to? Trump. Congratulations. Neoliberalism failed. And they won't let go. Howard Dean won't let go. Chuck Schumer won't let go. Karen Finney, Donna Brazile, they're all. Oh, 
by their fingernails. I still want this to work. It's got to work. Democrats are Republicans, and that's how we win. I'm here with Ron Placone, Steph Samarano, Hank Thompson. Anything to say about what you just saw Mark Blythe say? Well, I, I think to really sum it up in, in words way, uh, way not as uh, prolific as him, uh, man, we've been screwing over the working people for a long time, and now wage discrepancy is insane. You know, the figure I always like to point to, CEO to worker, 475 to 1. You know when they also had an explosion of CEO pay versus worker pay? They're in the Third Reich. Hmm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, when they had fascism in in uh, Germany. CEO pay exploded. Same thing. You know, I belong to one of the few unions that still survive in America, and that's a teacher's union. Mm-hmm. And I have to say that I think everybody should have a union. I agree. Because otherwise, who is there to protect no your one. rights? Who's there to protect your income? People don't have, and people go, yeah, you work for Walmart, it's a shitty job. It's the number one employer in America, biggest retail outlet in America, Walmart. When I was a kid, you got a job working for Sarah's Roebuck, you had a great job, no matter what it was. You could, you could have a family, you could go on vacation, your kids could go to college. But, you know, I want to also add to the very idea of the school that I work at Nobody at my school on a ten- teacher's income can afford to, to live teach and live in that same neighborhood. So that's happening in San Francisco that's where right. teachers can't afford to live in San Francisco. So what are they going to do? This, that's the system that the neoliberal geniuses like Hillary Clinton and Al Gore and Barack Obama have set up and supported. And now you wonder, so that's what's happening. So don't listen to any of those other people saying anything other than this. This guy was right about everything before. He predicted it. And he's got the right interpretation. And that's why we're bringing it to you here on the Jimmy Dore Show. Do not listen to Chris Hayes. Do not listen to Rachel Maddow. Do not listen to CNN. Do not listen to George Snuffleupagus or Brian Williams or any of those people. Don't listen to Joan Walsh. Don't listen to Ezra Klein. Don't listen to any of those people. They've got their, they have an interest in the system staying the way it is. And they have no idea what a working person is. None. They have no idea. Well, Jimmy, I think it's important to point out, too, that that on the micro level, you know, these companies that once, you know, you brought up Sears Roebuck or used to be a good job, used to pay good wages. Not only do these companies at the top not pay living wages anymore, but they're also the, quote, leeches on the system themselves. They're the, McDonald's counts on their employees to get assistance. Walmart. Uh, Walmart the, wreaks the can... environment. They're, 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 well, cat- they tell they're their, predators. They tell their new hires, here's how you can go get the public assistance mm-hmm. at Walmart. Here's how you go get public assistance. Same thing with that they You're saying they rely on government assistance for their workforce. They're the actual leeches and that's what, and that goes full circle with predatory capitalism, which I think is a term that we really need to take and run with, especially in this country because capitalism is that all. Well, right. capitalism you love is, it capitalism. can't be, it'd be like, well, alright, let's make a small uh, differentiation then. Predatory, predatory capitalism. The kind that's run by the banks now. Well, you know, when we were, um, attending the conventions yes and uh one of the areas that we were in the only place that i could go to to pick something up was a walmart and i picked up some bananas or whatever and the guy said ah the cashier at walmart said oh look look can you get a banana for this cheap anywhere else isn't it great and I just looked at him thinking to myself, you, look at how happy this cashier is. He, what a, you know, he loves his job, but his job doesn't love him. Rips him off every day. He doesn't earn a livable wage. And I think that's a tragedy. And what did you, we decide it is predatory capitalism? It's predatory capitalism. That, that, I mean, and we need to make that differentiation because, you know, I mean, certain amounts of capitalism aren't necessarily a bad thing. You know, th- there's a certain like, like uh, I think Henry Rollins said this, so I'm kind of quoting him here, but he's like, capitalism's great as long as you tie it down to the point where just the ring finger can move a little bit. <laughs> when you tie it down that great, it, it's not a bad thing at all. Uh, but we have predatory capitalism. So for me, the scary part about it is as the system crumbles, 
um, the symptom detection is very good. People know they're being screwed. People know that this, the, their governments all over the world don't work for them and don't have their best interest. But where the failure comes, and this is where I see tremendous risk, because I think there's a historical precedent for it, is as that starts to get worse, it's the the uh, um, the diagnosis of the source of the symptom, of the actual problem, which is blame the billionaires, blame the owners, blame the decision makers, blame the kings and the queens, so to speak. But people don't have the critical thinking skills to get that to make that leap on mass in a way that's effective. So what happens is you get like a, a third Reich comes along and they bl- blame a persecuted minority. They blame an ethnic group that everybody kind of gets mm-hmm. on board and some people are silent about it. And so I'm afraid that sort of thing is going to kick in after the Trump presidency starts to cause decline because they have all the incentive, the lack of morals and the the backing of the Republican Party that's going to control the entire all the branches of the government uh, to to do something like that again. So it's going to be extremely chaotic, and we have to rely on the bravery of of simple, ordinary, decent humans that step up and try to bog that system down. And sometimes that's not enough because sometimes we end up with a Hitler or we end up with you know that that kind of regime. It's time for the left to wake up. Yeah, time is here. We got the information. No more head in the sand. We got to cleanse the house. We got to get rid of the Nancy Pelosi's and the Chuck Schumer's and the Karen Finney's and the Debbie Wasserman Schultz's and the Donna Brazil's. And we got to get rid of them. And we got to populate the Democratic Party with progressives. And if we can, we got to start our own party and make the Democrats come to us. So if we get a party that's polling at 10 percent or 15 percent, then the Democrats have to come to us. And uh, then we have a coalition, and then we have a real progressive government. But going along, trying to do it inside the Democratic Party doesn't look like it's going to work.